I want to thank you folks for inviting me down here. Next thing, I want to congratulate you on having as many here as you have on your first anniversary. I think it was on our ninth anniversary that we had over in Akron High that I heard Doc get up and make this statement. I never paid much attention to statistics about any kind of statistics about AA. It never made any particular difference to me who was first, second, third, or fourth. How many but our Doc get up and make this statement? He said that our, at our first anniversary, uh, we had six at the end of the year. Well, I didn't remember that. And he said that four of them are here tonight. Uh, that was on our ninth anniversary. He said and four of them are here tonight. One of them dead and one of them out of town and couldn't be here. Well, I happen to know that a couple of them that were there had had little trouble uh, during those uh, nine years, but uh, they had, were there that night and uh, were sober. And uh, so that's all we had on our, our first anniversary was six, and of course there were several times, six here. And of course, uh, when we had that anniversary, I certainly never expected to be down in North Canton talking to folks. And there are a lot of the other places where I have been and talking. I we just had in mind that we'd get sober and stay sober. And uh, to do that, uh, we had to go out and take this program to a few people, and uh, enough to get sober and stay sober ourselves. And then that would be the end to it. Now that's all I had in mind. I know, and I'm pretty positive that uh, there wasn't anything much else in the mind of the others except to stay sober ourselves. Uh, that early thought has been worth quite a little bit to me. Uh, and in uh, two or three ways. I haven't felt any great responsibility about uh, the movement being such a wonderful uh, movement and all those great things is going to be done. I even had a woman after one of the meetings I was to, she come around, oh, she was been a missionary in China for a long time. Very wonderful woman. Oh, she said this is wonderful. She said maybe this is the answer. This is the answer to world peace. And I said, well, I don't know. Uh, anyhow, I hope it's uh, the answer to uh, peace in a lot of homes around here in Akron, where they used to get drunk and fight with each other. <laughs> now, if you can carry it on over and make a world peace out of it, that's fine. But uh, I have always had in mind that the main purpose of AA was to stay sober. And now there's a lot to AA, uh, uh, in my opinion, uh, that's uh, worth a lot more. And a lot in there outside of staying sober, but actually and honestly, I hope uh, that we always keep sobriety as the main purpose of AA. Now I know positively that that's the thing that we started out with was to stay sober. Uh, certainly I've got a lot of things out of it further than that. One fellow even argued with me about uh, not so long ago and said if sobriety had been the only thing he got, uh, it just wouldn't have been worthwhile. And I said, well, I don't know about you, but I know about me. I said, the first last six months I drank, I was dragged into the hospital eight times, six months. And four or five times of those times I've been tied down there to bed there too before ever I knew I was there. And I said, my doctor told me I didn't have a two or three more, and I know I knew as well as he knew uh, that I didn't have. He said, you get in such terrible shape that you're not going to make many more of them. And uh, I knew it. And uh, that was 16 years ago, and I'm still living, and... Uh, <coughs> Still feeling pretty good. In fact, just about a year ago, I uh, had some sort of virus and I stayed in bed two days. My wife kept telling me to go to the doctor, but I think it's just a sort of a cold, and I don't want to be bothered with doctors. And uh, 
But I did finally go home. He told me, he said, you, you sick. And I said, yeah, I know. But I came back and told my wife, she said, well, I kept wanting you to go to the doctor. She said, I knew you were sick. She said, that's the first time I've seen you stay in bed all day since I used to tie you in bed 15 years ago. <laughs> which, was the, which was the truth. I haven't thought about it. But I said that that happened to me the last six months I drank. And I've had, uh, since that time, uh, uh, day before yesterday, fourth day of July was when I came out of the hospital. Of course, I'd been sober some three or four days then. I mean, that was 16 years ago that I came out of the hospital, and I said I've had either 10 uh, years extra of life, I know, that have been good with good health. And then you tell me, uh, I said that certainly was worthwhile. If I had never gotten anything more out of a than that, that fact that I don't go to the hospital anymore and not go through all that hell and stuff that I went through with, and the fact that I've had that uh, number of years uh, of good life is certainly worthwhile if I had never gotten anything more. I did get a lot more out of it, and there's a lot more in it. And I hope that uh, folks will get it. And, but I still hope that we keep that sobriety the main purpose of AA. And, uh, you know, I, it's getting a little bit harder for me to lead a meeting right along. Uh, I think the re reason for that is that I've been doing it for so long. And the most of you fellows know that I've been doing it for so long. And uh, so you begin to wonder why in the devil I don't get any better than what I am. <laughs> and that makes it, makes it a little bit tough on me. Uh, well, that might be good, too. Maybe then they'll sort of stop asking me. You know, I was just talking. I, I think the first meeting that I went out of town to lead was over in Toledo, and I expect that was better than 10 years ago. Because I think it was about... Two years ago, I was over in Adrian, Michigan, and I was talking to Big Paul Zara, and I said the first time I was ever over here in, in Toledo, he was up there from Toledo, and I said that was about uh, seven or eight years, something like that ago. He said, well, I don't know exactly how long it's been. He said, I hadn't been sober but about three weeks, and I was at that meeting, and I've been sober eight years, so it's been better than ten years the first time and uh, I've been doing it, and there's a lot of you folks right back there that can do just as good a job as I can, and uh, you ought to be up here leading this meeting instead of me, uh, because you can do it just as well, and it will help you, uh, because in my opinion, there isn't anything much that uh, helps a person uh, more than leading a meeting. In fact, is that was one of the main things that they had in mind when we started out, when we went to a meeting in the early days, we didn't know when we went who was going to lead the meeting. We went and we had what we called quiet time, and uh, during that quiet time we was to open our minds uh, with for instruction as to who we thought ought to lead the meeting that night. And then after we uh, did that, they sat there in silence. Uh, for five minutes, why they start around, who do you think, and this fellow say this one, this one, that one, and whoever happened to have the most, we pointed to him and said, well, it's you. So he got up there and uh, and took charge of the meeting and uh, went ahead. And we didn't know until uh, we got there who was going to do it. And that wouldn't be a bad idea to try out, in my opinion, every once in a while here. It'll help, fella. It might uh, muss him up a little bit for a minute or two and did us, but we'll get over it. And uh, I used to say when I started out that if no one was helped in the meeting except me, uh, well, I certainly know I knew I would be by, by leading the meeting. It would help us. And uh, this idea of uh, these fine speakers and good speakers and so forth been called in. I, I, I never have been uh, too much in favor of that uh, because I've seen some mighty good fellows uh, take a licking on account of the fact that I'm very positive that 
and that idea that they were in demand quite a bit as speakers uh, sort of began to go to <clears throat> up here to the top of their head a little bit and they got a little proud of it and uh, in fact as I watched two or three of them and I was already wondering if that wasn't happening and uh, one or two of them it certainly happened terribly bad to them uh, now that might not have had anything to do with it but they did fall off and didn't do so good and I thought he wanted it uh, it's a little now I'm not saying what I got up here to say uh, <laughs> but it is a little hard you know uh, I, I, I was lucky I've been lucky all the way through eh? that, that helped me out an awful lot uh, I never could uh, feel uh, particularly uh, complimented by the reason of the fact that they asked me because they happened to ask me just because I happened to be uh, the first my person that Doc and Bill worked on and were successful with. I'm very positive that's the reason they asked me rather than uh, what I happened to say. Well, I had no control over the fact that they happened to be the ones that uh, that I happened to be the one that they picked up first, so I never could uh, feel that way about it. And uh, that's been been a, been a help for me. And, but I remember one time I came in there and at home. I've been to a meeting, and you know I think for the meeting, you know something getting sorry wrong with these meetings. They're not hardly up to par. And um, I don't know just what's the matter. What's, what's wrong? They ain't the same happening or something. I, I just wasn't. I was rather low about how he was going. And um, so uh, I picked up a little book there and opened it like this. No, I just saw it laying there. It was my wife's magazine. She, I know how to ever look at it. But I picked it up that night and pulled it open. Just a matter of luck. I never looked. Pulled it up there and I started to read. And uh, why? Well, I never even looked at the heading. I don't know yet what the heading of the article was, but the part I read was, uh, I'm a little ashamed to tell you this, but it actually happened. Uh, the fellow said he went over to his neighbors, and uh, the fellow insisted on showing him about an hour or better of uh, pictures, moving pictures that he'd taken of he and his family around the house there. Well, the man said, I had seen him day after day around there doing those same things, and I'd seen those rose bushes and things, and it really wasn't very interesting. It was rather boring to me to sit down and look at those pictures. And as it was over, he said, of course, naturally, to be polite, I had to say something to the little eight-year-old girl. He said, I looked over at her, and I said, well, what part of the picture did you like the best? Well, she said, the part I was, the part I was in, of course, she said. <laughs> well, I'll do. And that came in my mind. Now, do you reckon that's what is sort of the matter? Maybe they sort of uh, slipped up here. Maybe they haven't been paying you hardly as much attention. Maybe you haven't read as many meetings. In the last, uh, I won't tell you this, I'm probably ashamed of it, uh, but it might help you. And I said to them, they've been paying as much attention to you as they should, or something like that, that's the reason you're finally hurt. And uh, when I analyzed it down, right down the fact, I had to come to the conclusion that possibly that might have had something to do with the fact that I thought those meetings weren't hardly as entertaining as they had been because I hadn't had the uh, spatial attention uh, that I maybe thought that I ought to have. Uh, although I really never particularly wanted any spatial attention because, and I've told them over and over again I don't, because I'm very positive uh, that if anybody else uh, begins to set me up there as uh, somebody to go by and lean on and give me spatial attention while the old devil, he'll start giving me spatial attention too. And I've had about all the attention from that boy for the last 16 years and all my life that I uh, really want. Now, I don't say that in any sacrilegious way. I mean it. Because he's always right after a fellow. And if he says, oh, well, if I kick Bill out, I can knock a half a dozen, well, he'll concentrate on me, and I don't need any concentration. <laughs> and uh, that's neither here nor there. But I, I thought about that, that that might happen. And, uh, but the fact, as I mentioned a while ago, that 
it's the idea of sobriety and the reason that we are primarily in AA and the fact that I never expected any great world movement or anything like that to go out of it has helped me because in that way I can go ahead and do AA and practice AA the same way it was taught to me which I'm going to give it to you directly in about, and it only takes me about 10 minutes to do that. That's what I ought to do, of course, and quit, but I keep on talking for a long time to get up to it. And uh, it helped me to go ahead and practice and talk at the age just the way I learned it without feeling too much responsibility of what's going to happen to the movement. And... Uh, arguing with uh, this bunch that wants to do it this way and arguing with this bunch that wants to do it that way. And now uh, there's quite a little bit of that, you know, that's going on around now. And some of them want it this way and some of them want it the other way. And I told a fellow today, he came all the way down to Cleveland and bought my dinner to give me hell for some things that he thought was so and so. And I just told him, I said, now wait, I learned this A one way. And I learned AA that the main purpose that I was in AA was not to save the world and not to save a lot of people, but to keep Bill Dotson sober. That's the main reason I'm in there. To do that, uh, I have to take this message. Uh, two people, uh, and now from now on, they have to take over. I can't keep them sober. I couldn't keep them sober. I couldn't save the world. I don't think I was expected to save the world. And then the fact is, I can't think that you can find any place in the Bible, any place, where anybody was supposed to save anybody. If you go back and read the four synoptic uh, Gospels, uh, you'll find that just before pre Jesus uh, ascended, he said, Go ye into all the world, preach the gospel. He never told you to save anybody. I even read in the paper today where that fellow ministered up there was a walking so and so so he could save a lot of people, see. Uh, I don't think we do that, and I don't think we keep them sober. We can take them the message, uh, but from uh, there on, uh, it's between them and, and this higher power as to what happened. And uh, that's what I've been doing is. When they asked me to go around and tell folks uh, their program as they gave it to me and sometimes a few other little things, I've noticed that uh, uh, I heard a fellow get up and say in the King's School on Wednesday night, and it's the first time I heard him admit it that way. Uh, he said he stayed sober seven and a half years, and then he got drunk and it took him about 15 months to get sober back. Well, that was true, and I knew it, and he's been sober since. Uh, uh, and he admitted that he said I was a terribly intolerant son of a gun. He said I just didn't have no damn use for these fellows that came into AA and, and slipped. He said I just couldn't see it tolerant. Well, I thank goodness I never had that kind of experience. When he comes around and tells me, he said, oh, he said I had a slip. I said the damn yeah, he just went out and got drunk. Just exactly the same way I did hundreds of times. That's right. I knew I shouldn't. I went out and did it. Now, that's just what you did. No flipping or anything else. Just start right over again. Uh, of course, uh, maybe AA would look better to the outside world if we uh, saved our brother, the fellow that came around and, and uh, said he belonged to AA. I don't know how in the world he belongs to AA. Uh, there wasn't any joining or anything like that when, uh, when I came in. And uh, now I'll ramble around there and talk to you. It was, as I mentioned a while ago, it was 16 years ago, the, about the 26th of June that I came to over there in the city hospital in Akron, Ohio. One Thursday morning, that's the only way in the world that I... Uh, I knew what the particular day it was. Uh, I knew it was Wednesday, and I went in there. And the only way in the world that I remembered a year or two later uh, that it was Wednesday was that uh, I knew I started on Saturday. And uh, the last time before that, uh, that I had come out of the hospital, I told my wife, I said, "Thanks." 
Don't let me get in this terrible shape anymore before I get into the hospital. I've been never been to hell the last few times, I'll tell you. Uh, see if you can't get me to go out the hospital. It usually took me about 10, 12 days from the time I took that first drink until I ended up over there in the hospital tied down. It took 10 or 12 days. Uh, a week of it out, round and round, like that, me in and out. And then the last week of it up there on the third floor in my home, so I was supposed to be out of town, and if anybody come in, they wouldn't hear me up there. And uh, I just laid up there in, in that bed on the third floor by myself, which was my bedroom. It was on the second. But I'd go up there and hide, and every time I'd wake up, I'd just reach over and get the bottle and take another drink and go back to sleep. And keep that up for about a four or five days or a week. Finally, it comes a day, you know, you've heard fellas talk about uh, throwing them up, you know, couldn't get them down in the morning. Well, I'll throw them up, 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 up like that. But that never made any stick of difference to me, because I knew that if I kept on swallowing them, I'd finally get one that would stay down exactly. And, uh, but, if you do like what I talk to you just about throwing you, Spend about a week, drink, 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 and then last week up there on the floor, just not no we just reach over to the bottle and go back to sleep. Finally, you wake up someday and look at it, and you said, now, it wouldn't do any good. It just wouldn't do any good. You fool, that now is long. It's going to do any good. Another day or so of this, and you'll be dead. So I got off my wife to get a hold of the doctor. I didn't go to the hospital only for the six weeks, but the last two or three years I drank, I never got over one without having to call a doctor. Fine time finally comes when you look at it and you know that it isn't going to do any good. Say another drink isn't going to do you any good. You're just so full and sick of it that you wouldn't say anything about throwing it up, but you just know it isn't going to do you any good. One of any years from trying to take it. Then you have to do something about it. And uh, so I told her not to let me get so bad the next time, so I started on Saturday. And I isn't that odd? I remember just how I took that first drink on Saturday. I went home early from the office, figuring that uh, to stay sober. And then I got home, got up there to the house, and it was uh, June, it was hot, and I got dry, dry. And I wanted to drink worse and worse, and there was a place over there where they sold only liquor and uh, wine and uh, no whiskey. And uh, so I fooled, shook, and bothered and fooled around there. I uh, hadn't had a drink probably for a couple of weeks then, maybe, at least that long. And But I was so nervous, and I wanted to drink. And I finally sold myself, and I guess, I mean, I, I sold my wife. Well, I don't guess I sold either one of us. I don't know, but I, I tried to sell her on the idea that I'd just run over there and have a cold cup, a cold glass of beer and come back. It was time for dinner or supper, whichever you call it, about 5 o'clock in the afternoon. And it was about time to eat, she had to buy bread, and I'll just run over there, and I'll have a cup of cold bottles of beer, and I'll run right back. And eat my supper and I won't get drunk. Now I know if I'm going to drink a couple of cold bottles of beer, damn if I'm going to eat right after it because that's just wasted. That's all. I'm going to only have a couple. I ain't going to waste it to eat right after But I really thought that that could be done, see? And I guess I, and I even told her I'll take the boy. He's about eight or nine years. I'll take the boy along uh, to ensure the fact that I'm going to come back. And, um, well, I don't guess I made her believe it, but she didn't anyhow win. And of course, about 11 o'clock, she come over and got the boy. <laughs> and took him home, and she didn't bother me. Of course, I stayed all night. As soon as they closed that up, I went looking for a bootleg job. For the shoulder my as well. And found him. And stayed there and went home sometime the next day. And I told her, for goodness sakes, don't let me get that bad anymore. So some way or other, on Wednesday, she coaxed me into the hospital, and I went into the hospital. That's the reason I know this Wednesday. I hadn't been drinking so long. And I wasn't so bad that morning. 
And so I came to the on Thursday morning, and uh, my mind was probably clear because I'd only been drinking since Saturday. And uh, so I looked around, and I realized where I am again. And I said, well, here you are again. And you've been here, either here or over in the people. This makes eight times now in six months. And every time you woke up or you went out of this hospital in this last six months, you went out of here fully determined in your own mind that you weren't going to get drunk for something like six or eight months. I don't think I said I was going to quit. But I went out there fully determined that I wasn't going to be drunk for six or eight months because I couldn't afford it. I was broke and wasn't going to be long for my wife and boy. It was going to be on charity, which would be terribly humiliating. And not only that, it was going to be, uh, I was going to have to start uh, to uh, panhandling and drink. And boy, that would be hell. I always felt for a panhandling. Because when I wanted to drink, I wanted it. I didn't want to have to go out and try to beg somebody and spend a half an hour trying to get a hold of a drink. I wanted it right then. And I didn't want to have to. Now, now I could picture myself out down there on the street trying to get a hold of enough money to go and buy me a drink. And after maybe, maybe an hour or two, when I'd be along it like I would like that, and I, I just knew it would just be terrible. But anyway, I come to the door and I said, here you are. And you didn't intend to be here. Time after time, you've been doing this now here, and you're going out of here full of determined. You weren't going to get drunk anymore for six months, at least six or eight months, until you got a little money. And got back a little self-respect. Uh, of your own, a little towards people to show that you can do something about it. What are you going to do about it? And I didn't know. No, I didn't want to do it. And that was odd. Right then, the boy comes along and says, Get on, this old cop is going upstairs. Well, I didn't want to argue with him. I did a little bit. But he said, Get on. I don't want to argue. And I, he's argued I've never seen him before. But he told me that he's dying. It's funny. I did ask him, How do you know me? He called call me old cop. I never saw you before in my life. He said, The devil you haven't. I've read it with you over there in that emergency ward night after night. When they left you over there, they wouldn't take you up to the hospital. They left you over there for me to wrestle with you. And then, <laughs> think, I don't know you. Well, I've never seen him before. I went to the group. But I've been over there, but I didn't see him. And uh, so off I went, and I got up there, and my wife was sitting there, and being kind to him. Well, I really didn't know what was happening. My wife would always come to the hospital and speak to him. Visit me, I don't know why she would, but she did. I remember she come walking in uh, one morning I, with the doctor. I said, good morning, doc, good morning, honey. I've been awake just a few little while, you know. I turned out at 11 o'clock and it was daylight. I knew it was 11 o'clock in the day. I kept looking around at my wife and I said, why don't you go to Sunday school, honey? Sure. She said, Sunday school. Well, yeah, I said, Sunday school church. Why don't you Sunday school church? I was a Saturday when, about noon when I went in, you know. And uh, she said, what time do you think it is? 11 o'clock. I knew right off because I just found out. <laughs> well, I know, but she said, what day? Oh, I said. She said, this is Monday. This ain't Sunday. Well, <laughs> I didn't know. <laughs> Now, where I'd been all day from Saturday, from Saturday noon until Monday morning, 11 o'clock. Like, uh, well, I'd been there and the hospital died down, but I had no remembrance of it. Nothing that I remember. I thought it was still Sunday. She ought to be in church. So she was sitting there, and I said, hello. And she said, hello. And I let her do the talking. I didn't have anything to say. I was licked. See, I, I, I just didn't have any answers. Uh, and uh, I didn't have any answer this morning. I've been talking to a couple of folks about your drink. Well, I thought that is odd. 
been a lot of talk around our house about drinking. I knew some church members been down there, and I knew two or three preachers been down there praying with the wife about me. I wasn't when I was there because I wouldn't listen to them. I didn't want to listen to them. I went to church and listened to what they had done and what in the hell they wanted me to listen to me about drinking. They never got drunk and what, what would I listen to them? They tell me all the friends. <laughs> oh my. I knew so much more about how I ought to quit the man. I knew more about how bad my finances were. I knew that for hours of hell that I went through with night after night. And them tell me all to quit. What I want to do is, uh, if they could have, told me how, but uh, they tell me I ought to, you know. And uh, also tell me uh, how that I could, which I guess I knew probably was right. But uh, it was so tough that way, I just couldn't make it. I just had to be the dag going much better than I, I than I just knew I couldn't be that good. And uh, of course, I was pretty much like the woman that the uh, minister was trying to get to join the church. And finally, she said, "Well, minister," she said, "I'll join, but she said you'll have to bear with me. You'll have to be." Easy. She said, I'm going to have a tough time. She said, you know, it seems strange, but she said, it seems like everything I like to do is either illegal, immoral, or fattening. She said, <laughs> she said it's just going to be tough. <laughs> so I guess I knew that was the answer, but uh, I didn't know how to get it. That way, I didn't know how I could make it. I've done a lot of praying about it, but as soon as I start praying about it, so the ideas come up about cigarettes and little penny ante poker, and going to fix the shows, my church frowns on all those, and they wouldn't even permit me to smoke if I was up there in their basement tonight. I couldn't smoke there. I could get up and go out like we always do when we have a social group. We'd up and go outside and outside the door and smoke. Well, I don't know whether it's... <laughs> And then what for harm to smoke down there in the basement it would be outside there, just outside the door or not, I don't know. But all those things that bob up there, and I said, I don't know. I, I, I couldn't, I, I just can't, I just can't. I know I won't be able to be that good. I've done a lot of praying about it and all those little things that come up. I say, yeah, yeah, Lord, I'll, I'll do that too, sure. I'll, I'll do everything. But I'm a liar, and I know. Finally, I... Said, well, there's no use in you lying to the Lord and praying for help when you know you're lying and you're not ready to do them things. So I quit praying, and that's when I sure did start sliding then because I didn't have anything to hold on to then, and I certainly started starting in the downer's grave time. And but my wife said, I've been, uh, you know, said, I've been talking to a couple of fellows about you drinking. No, I thought that's funny. Now, that's the way I got A. That's the way I'm telling me. Of course, it isn't all that way, but it's sort of along that line, in my opinion. I'm just telling you those things that happened to pop in my mind that helped me. The next thing she said to me, she said, you're going to quit. And I think, well, worry devil, did you ever get any assurance like that? You must have hit a couple of daggone good sales. <laughs> that makes you think, that makes you think, because you said a couple of men, and that makes you think that I'm going to quit. I haven't heard you say that for a long, long time. She just didn't say anything about it. And she didn't hear me say I was going to quit. I always, always say, I, I'll have to cut this out. I'll have to quit this. I'll have to cut this out, you know. I guess I knew I couldn't quit, so I didn't want to go back on my word, and I'd just go around to help her and maybe help myself, too, saying that I'll have to cut it out. I'll have to cut it out. No, and that I couldn't. I remember way back in 1960, and I don't know what year it was, because it was uh, my uh, junior year in the university, and, of course, a certain boy was room with me at that time, and I had been terrible. I want to tell you one the night before, one still was that morning, but sick, and I was sitting there on the bed, and I was a heaving and a gagging and a heaving and going off, and this little mountaineer, he was worse drunk than I was, he looked over at me and he said, why don't you quit? <laughs> <laughs> I told him, you know, you'd see him and the way with the 
crowd even funnier. And I looked at him as funny as thick as I was. And I said, Where? Well, yeah, he said, It's easy, it's no trouble. I'll put a thousand dollars. <laughs>
So I said, uh, what are they going to charge me? She said, well, you know, that's the strange thing about it. She said, not only were they, they said not only were they going to, now they weren't going to charge you anything, but they said you couldn't pay them a cent <laughs> if you had a million dollars. I think that's the devil of poor racket. They ain't gonna get no place that way. <laughs> but there's another thing in there, Darn, and I'm not gonna preach to you. You run and lay your way. See, I'm not gonna tell you. Because if you don't get it right and you get drunk, it's gonna be you that's gonna be sick and not me. I'll sympathize with you, but I'd rather be you because I don't want to try it anymore. I had enough. They wouldn't take a cent for that work if you had a million dollars. You couldn't pay them for it. Now that's the way it started out. But I take no pay for it. I'm not fine for it for anybody else, but that's the thing that that was one of the main things that helped me to believe that these fellows had something. There were two fellows I'd never seen or heard tell of that was four weeks under just like I was. And they were willing to come over there and take their time and talk to me to show me a program whereby I could stay sober and not only would they not charge me anything, but I couldn't pay them if I wanted to. And that was really the first thing that interested me in AA. And I told my wife to come over and they came over, and I could have given you this program a long time ago. You see, there wasn't any book then, there wasn't any 12 steps, there wasn't any of this other nice, good literature we have, some good and some not so good, and that we have around. And we didn't have any of those things. It was just those two fellows there that said they wanted to get sober. And they thought they'd hit on a program, and whereby they could stay sober, and the part of that program was that they had to bring it up to me, and I sort of forgot that last thing because they, they, they told me that was part of the program that they had to bring the thing to me. And here was the program. So I say, you know, 12 steps. Now, I, the 12 steps are all right. They're fine. And, uh, but I learned it the other way. They told me that I had to really want to quit. Uh, they said, if you don't want to quit, well, that's your privilege. Just go ahead and get drunk. That's all right. We know it's the chicken liquor. Uh, we want to stay sober. And to stay sober, we got we have a program. And to stay sober, we think we have to take that program to somebody else. Now, if you want to go out and get drunk and get sick and drive down in this hospital like this, well, all right, then we'll just glide on out. We won't argue with you. That's your free privilege. Well, I said, them fellas, they're pretty uppish about this thing. All these other fellas want to plead with me, you know. And they said, <laughs> if you want us to get drunk, okay, get drunk. But they said, we, we, we want to quit, and we'd like to see you quit. But we'll leave it to you if you want to quit. And uh, then they asked me, they said, do you think you can quit by yourself? Well, that's pretty hard to answer. I'd always been pretty self-sufficient. But I was going to run things, just as I was. And I had told a lot of fellows, I saw my cousin die before he was 27 years old from liquor that I used to run with. I got him in bed night after night with DT. I saw him die. But I was smart. I wasn't going to let him do that. And he told me, he said, Bill, I, I don't want to get drunk like this. But he said, oh, I can't help it. Well, I used to start like the preacher. <laughs> I thought, we well, ain't using good sand. I told him, I said, gee, you're drinking too much too often. A lot of them asked me, he said, all these you're about and why you get the alcoholics. And I said, I don't know, after hearing all those stories. I finally come to the conclusion, and the reason I became an alcoholic was that I drank too much whiskey too often over too long a period. I think that's what happened. Now, if I, could, if I could avoid it just one of those, maybe I would have become an alcoholic, and I thought I was going to avoid them, but I kept on until I was as bad as she was. And, uh, but I kept on, as I saw, fellas, I said, now when it starts doing me like that, well, I'm going to quit. Well, 
Well, I got out of my dinner party bag, and I said, wow, that's pretty tough. But I, I do know when it starts doing me like this, fella, then I know I'm going to do something about it. And I just went right on, clear down the bottom. I just kept lowering the standards. Years and years, I, my standards got worse when I lowered it, too, and so I was clear down to the bottom. And as far as liquor was concerned, I hadn't been down in the jungle because I'd had a little money left me and I'd had some few days before I got to bed and so I had run out and I kept moving the banks. I was pretty slick at that. And uh, so I had had run me out longer. I would have been down there before. So they told me I had to have an honest desire and wish to quit. Well, I don't guess I wanted to quit. But oh my goodness, I'd have had enough of this kind of getting drunk. There wasn't anything in that anymore. I'm sure it was. I certainly, if I didn't want to quit drinking, I wanted to get, quit getting drunk and getting taken over to the hospital and tied down and put in jail and things like that. I didn't like that. And so they asked me then the next question whether they, I thought I could quit by myself, and that was pretty hard to answer. And I could, I uh, hated to admit that I had a problem that I couldn't handle, a little silly thing like that. Anyhow, I ought to be able to have done that. I was going to do it all my life. They said, now, if you can handle it by yourself, all right, then we go around and we look for somebody who can't handle it. And uh, said, we want to quit. And to do that, we got to take this problem to somebody that wants to quit and knows that he can't quit. And we just waste some time. If you don't want to quit, a waste of time if you don't, uh, if you think you can quit by yourself. That's fine. Just go ahead and quit. And they left me there to say these things on, and they asked me uh, another question. They said, do you believe in a higher power? I said, yes, I believe in God, and I believe in the Bible. I never have lost that faith. I know that's the answer, but how in the hell am I going to get it? Because I just can't be that good. I, I just can't. I, I said, I do these little things. What am I going to do about that? Well, they gave me some very good sense there. They said, well, now, let's, don't you think that this drink problem is causing you more trouble than anything else now? And don't you think that you're going to have about all that you can do to get rid of this drink problem? Don't you think it's going to use about all your time now getting rid of this? Well, I said, I won't be surprised. I certainly haven't been doing very good at it. Well, they said, now, let's concentrate on the drink, and we'll forget the cigarettes penny handy poker and the other little things like that for a while. You concentrate on this thing and you work on that. And then after we get sort of straightened out on that, then uh, you start thinking about some other things and uh, if uh, you still think you'll get rid of that, well then you start working on those. Well no, I said that's pretty good sense. Pretty good sense. So I said, I am. Uh, I believe in the Bible, believe in God, I know that's the answer, and I, that I can, but I haven't been able to get it. Then the next question they asked me was, would I be willing in the presence of somebody else? We sort of slipped that, we don't use that exactly that way anymore, but they said, would you be willing in the presence of somebody else to go to this higher power, which to me was God, and admit that you have a problem that you can't handle and that you won't help. And they left me there to study no I had to want to quit. I had to realize that I couldn't do it by myself. I had to believe in some higher power that could help me. And I had to be willing to humble myself enough to go to that higher power and admit that I was, uh, had a problem that I couldn't handle and ask for help. And I stayed there on that old hospital bed and got no wind in July and I put up a fire. I thought about all the things that I was going to have to give up if I made this surrender. But all the old roads looked pretty dim, dark. I say that straight and narrow road. And it sure looked really narrow. I think, boy, I ain't never going to have no more fun. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. I'm telling you the truth. I said, just ain't going to be no fun in this life at all. Oh, I know now. 
the devil, he was fooling me, you know. He had them things. He knew what was holding me back. And he was using them things, you know. And I was still pretty worldly. I had a lot of worldly things yet. So I went over all those things that they said to me, and I went over back over my life, things that I'd thrown away, material things, and other things that I'd thrown away. The material things didn't worry me too much. And although I certainly didn't have any of them left, and the opportunities that I had didn't worry me too much. But I then began to think about the humiliation and sorrow and things that I had caused some other mighty fine people. My mother and my wife, the boy was getting old enough to know. And uh, I just went back over what kind of a heel I'd been. And I can tell you the thing didn't look very nice. It certainly didn't. I'd had an awful lot of people that had been awful nice to me. My dad and mother sent me to school and paid money. Uh, they didn't have to go without something to eat to do it. But I remember I knew that I was drunk back in 1917. My dad got killed in that year and I was over in school and I was drunk when they called on the telephone over there. I was pretty drunk, but I was handling it pretty good in those days. They brought him over there to Lexington and he died. Where to take him home? I had to take my bottles along with me. But I didn't get real drunk. I was drinking whiskey then and Boston. And uh, then I was my senior year in university, and now was the first time I started to die. I knew I was a drunk. I said, well, now here's the chance. You're drunk and you know it. Now your dad left your mom here with two little kids and a 300 acre farm. Uh, you better stay at home and help your mother. Uh, and look after this farm until spring comes on. That was in February. And you better stay right there and help her. She didn't need me. We had some hard hands. And this farm could have been on. I wasn't very far away. But I made that as an excuse. And I'll go back to the university and finish in the summer term. I was thinking that if I got away from school and stayed down on the farm, because through the summer I went home, I, I had to stay pretty. I did get drunk some, but I had to be pretty careful about Dad because he'd throw me out and I wouldn't get no more money down to school, and I knew it. So when I got drunk and went home on the farm, I had to be mighty careful about it. And uh, so uh, I stayed around there. Then Mom said, well, all right, she'd rather go back to school. So I took that as an excuse, and I stayed around there. Loving April, that part of April, and one day I'm talking to her in the room, and uh, I wanted to drink, and I had my pocket. So I just stepped in the other room, of course I want to head better sense, and I closed the door right in her face. Pulled my bottle out and started taking a drink, you know. So she just opened the door and looked in there. She stood there and looked at me, man, and come back crying. She said, are you a drunkard? I said, yes, I guess I am. She said, well, I believe you're as bad as her on me already. I mean, he wasn't going to live because the doctor told me. She said, I believe you're as bad as he is. Well, I said, almost, no. She said, what are we going to do about it? I said, I don't know. Well, she said, I don't either. She said, your dad and I sent you over school right now for four years, and all you learned over there was to be a drunkard. I said, I guess that's right. I said, I'll go down and join the arm. And it's over. Well, I won't win to that story. That was a long time ago. Mom only up 13 years after I got sober. And I was awful glad. But I went back over, and I'm going to make, I should have quit already. I went back over all those things that I treated those people, and I said, boy, you sure have been a ego. And you don't have very much left now. The rest of the time, you better start trying to do something about and make up for some of those things that you've done towards people. So I said, well, Lord, I've had enough of this. I don't want to get drunk anymore. I've had enough. According to what the doctor says and according to what I say, I don't have for him anymore. Days around here, I'm pretty well wrecked from every standpoint in the world. I'm wrecked. I don't have very much left to turn over to you, but 
Well, whatever I, what I have left, I'm going to turn it over to you now. I'm not going to be the captain of the boat now, because, boy, I've been running this boat now for a long time. Now I sure have made a wreck out of it. From now on, I'm going to try to find out each day uh, instructions from you. I'm not going to get, when I do even pray, tell you what all the things that I want. You know, there's another thing I ought to quit. Some an awful lot of these prayers are almost sacrilegious as we hear. For an hour sometimes, they'll tell the Lord what he ought to do, what they think is all he ought to do down here in this world. They'll just try it over and over again, tell the Lord what he ought to do all the time. He knows what to do. I'd like to spend a little more time asking the Lord that we might be worthy that we get some of these things that we're asking for. Like the woman told the little boy, he cut out and said he's proud. He said, Mom, how'd you like that? Well, she said that was pretty good, but she said, why don't you spend a little less time telling the Lord what to do and a little, just report for duty and he'll let him tell you what to do. So I said, now, instead of uh, going ahead and running this thing, telling you to come on and help me put this over and this over, I'm going to try to find out what you want me to do. I'm going to try to do it. I'm going to try to find out what your will is for me, and I'll do the best that I can to carry it out. I know I'm human, and I won't be able to do it all the time, but I'll keep on trying. If I fall down, I'll go back. Ask me again, because I don't want to drink anymore. I've had all this I want. Just had all I want, and I want to quit. I've had enough. And uh, I'm going to rely entirely upon you. When that old talk about drink starts coming on, I ain't going to carry on that argument. Every time I started thinking about a drink when I was trying to stay dry, an argument came up. Should I, shouldn't I? Then I could get more excuses somewhere or other than why I should. Any guy who ever was carrying on the other side of that argument about I should was sure a winner, because he nearly always did. I said, Lord, when that argument comes up from now on, I'm going to turn that argument over to you, because that's one argument I always lost. And I'm going to let you handle that job, and uh, I ain't going to even start any argument about it. I'll just sit well now here. You take this problem over. And, uh, I've had enough. I don't want to do this anymore. Anything that I have to give up or anything I have to do, I'm willing to do when I'm man. I've said that before, but I didn't mean it. And I got drunk. So when these folks come back, I said, well, I've had enough. I don't want to get drunk and sick anymore. And as I hate to do it, I'll have to admit that I, I can't do anything about it because I know I couldn't or I wouldn't have gone through this. I do believe in that higher power, and I already have gone to that higher power, and asked for help, and I'm willing to do it again here or any place in the world. It doesn't make any difference. I'll never be ashamed to admit that I have to go and ask for that help any place where it might be. I've done that, and I'll do it again. I don't know whether I did, did, whether I did it or not, but I told them I was willing to. They said, that's fine. Now, there's one other thing you got to do. You gotta go out and take that same program to somebody else. And that's what I'm doing here tonight. I could have made it a lot shorter and quit. Not kept you folks. And uh but you know these days get started to talk when I went over to Adrian Mission not so long ago and as I went along they told me this story. It sort of did click, but I forget it every once in a while. Said there was one of these fellows up talked on and on, you know. The crowd got rested from Charmin, he found it on the desk. There was a hammer and uh, they finally quieted him down. They got restless again. This fellow went on and on. He found it again. That finally quieted him down. They got restless again. He got some sort of angry and he hit the desk real hard. Flopped over here. They hit the fellow sitting here in the front and started to hit and knocked him out of the chair. The fellow sitting there by him, he reached down right quick and grabbed him and picked him up. He said, are you hurt? Are you unconscious? He said, no, I can steal your aim. He said, hit me again. <laughs> now, that was the as I got it. And that's the way I've been going out to tell them. I haven't had as much 
to it because I'm sort of afraid to. It's been worth too much to me. It's meant those eight or ten years of my life. I, I know these last eight or ten years and have been with good health and so on. Uh, and so I certainly think an awful lot of it because I've heard an awful lot of people say that they were sober as a result of following that program of the 12 steps they were added in as we went along and already learned. You can take those five that I gave you and pretty much spread them out and make 12 out of them. And that was what was done. And I've heard so many people say that they were happy for the reason of following that program. And I know that there's a lot of people out that are happy and in homes and happy homes that otherwise would have been dead or they've been in the asylum or they've been in jail tonight. And the program means a lot to me. And I certainly hope we keep it simple along that line. And if you read this, uh, uh, this last, uh, uh, reader, or uh, grapevine, you'll see the first article in there by Paul DeGree, or whatever his name is. And he says he was an atheist, he wasn't a drunkard, but he learned. He said he was an absolute atheist. But he said by his association with AA, he had become to believe in God and pray. Now that's worth an awful lot to that man. That's worth an awful lot to him. And he said it was the simplicity and the way that we went at it that brought him from complete atheism back to a place where he could pray to God. And I've heard so many people, so many places all around over the country say this. I came into AA solely for the purpose of sobriety, but it's been through AA that I have found God. And I know, and the most of you know, how well worthwhile that is. That's the reason I hope we keep our AA reposal. I don't get angry because I, particularly I, because I don't feel too much responsibility myself. The only thing in this program that I have it's worthwhile that I can take the program on that somebody gave to me and whereby I have had the benefits of that I can take it on to them and give it to them. But from now on, it's between them and that high power whether they make it or not. There isn't any question about that. It's between them and their high power whether they're able to make it or not. And so I, for that reason, I don't get too much disturbed when I see these things breaking around because I'm very positive the foundation is there. The program is on a good, firm foundation. It's doing an awful lot of good for it to disintegrate and go along. And I thank you folks for being as patient as listening to me uh, for as long as you did. And uh, thank you for inviting me down here and congratulate you on the number you have here in this, uh, uh, your first anniversary. And I wish you a lot more good anniversaries and thanks.